tripped over this twice already. Good morning again, everybody. Please, if I could ask you to please take your seats, we're going to get started. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 2023 State of the Beltline. 
I'm Michael Paris. I'm President and CEO of the Council for Quality Growth. And on behalf of our co-host, the Atlanta Beltline, Inc., and the Atlanta Beltline Partnership, I want to welcome you all to here today in this great, great facility. We're so happy to be here at Uptown Atlanta. It's quite a room here. Uh, if you had been here before, uh, I'll come back and visit sometime. This is a beautiful facility, and I want to give a special thank you to Mahesh Mani, He's Senior Vice President with Rubenstein Partners for hosting us here today. Let's give them a great round of applause. Thank you, guys. We have a great crowd here today, and I want to thank each and every one of you for your support of the Beltline and your commitment to its continued success here in Atlanta. And of course, we want to thank Rob Broder, the Executive Director of the Beltline Partnership, and Clyde Higgs, who's President and CEO of the Atlanta Beltline, Inc., for partnering with us again on this event. We truly value this opportunity to provide this platform for an annual update on all the Beltline has accomplished over the last year and all of the new exciting things in the works. So we have a big crowd here today. We have a number of elected officials. We have many members of the city council. I want to start off by recognizing Mayor Andre Dickens, who you'll hear from in just a second. And can I ask everybody from the Atlanta City Council and any other elected officials here today to please stand so we can recognize you. Please stand. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. So today we have an exceptional program. We'll start with an ex our executive discussion between Clyde and Rob, moderated by Anna Roach, Executive Director of the Atlanta Regional Commission. Clyde will then give a prelude to our transit discussion before he's joined then by our expert uh, uh, panelists to talk about enhancing equity and mobility on the Beltline through transit initiatives. So these panelists include Ambrish Baisawala, Chairman and CEO of Portman Holdings, Lisa Benjamin, Chief Operating Officer of the City of Atlanta, Kali Greenwood, Managing Director and CEO of MARTA, and Jim Irwin, President of New City, LLC. Now, today's program would not be possible without the support of our many sponsors, and I'd like to name them off. Uh, it, you can see their names on the screen. Uh, first off, our, our platinum sponsors today include Georgia Power and Volker. Our gold sponsors are Empire Communities, Mar MARTA, Pond and Company, and WSP. Our silver sponsors are Astra Group, Atkins, Hammond and Associates, Heath and Lineback, Kimley Horn, Reeves Young, Truist, and United Consulting. And our bronze sponsors today include CIRM, The Collaborative Group, HDR, Kaiser Permanente, Smith Real Estate Services, Verizon, and VHB. Thank you all for your help today, and let's give them all a great round of applause. So as everyone knows, the Council for Quality Growth has been committed to improving Metro Atlanta communities for over 38 years. We're a voice for the development industry, and we value the opportunity to convene the public and private sectors across the region in this way. The State of Beltline is our ninth and final State of event this year, and they'll start all over again in January, so keep an eye on your, uh, on your email, of which you get plenty from us, I know. Uh, it's, it's such a great way to highlight the work of our county and agency partners and highlight what they're doing year long to move our region forward. So the Council is grateful for our close partnership with the Atlanta Beltline, Inc. and the Atlanta Beltline Partnership. Our ability to collaborate with you ensures that everyone has a voice in how Atlanta grows and how Atlanta thrives. And we could not serve our own members without the support of leaders like Clyde and Rob and the many elected officials here and business leaders here in the room today. The council is a voice on the policies and issues such as those on our agenda here today, and we're tracking local policy initiatives across our region's 88 local governments. Right, Anna? It is 88 local governments now. Unbelievable. Every day to ensure the regulatory environment is conducive to high-quality development and that our metro region continues to thrive. 
If you're not a member of the council, we urge you to become a member today. You can see our folks in the back of the room before you leave, uh, leave here today. So please mark your calendar for a couple of uh, important signature events coming up. Next, we will host our 14th annual CID recognition event on November 14th at Monday Night Garage. This is where we gather all of our community improvement districts together, give out the John Williams Award, give out the Professional Excellence Award. It's a great event to recognize everything our CIDs do across the region. Look, th look that up. I hope you'll be a part of that on uh, November, on no November 14th. And then shortly after, on December 7th, we're back at the Cherokee Town and Country Club for our 38th annual meeting and legislative reception. It's a great event, great to be there, especially around the holidays. Registration and sponsorships are open for both of those events, so please take advantage of that. All right, now, here to give a welcome on, on behalf of the great city of Atlanta, please welcome Mayor Andre Dickens. Mayor. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, it's good to see all of you this morning. Clyde, thank you for your outstanding leadership over this Beltline. Rob and all the team at uh, Beltline Inc. as well as Beltline Partnerships. I'm just thankful for you guys and your leadership. Lisa Gordon, the CO COO of the city is here. She'll be on a panel real soon. Uh, Council President, and council members, it's good to share space with you of this amazing project of the Beltline. Thank you for your partnership and your continued leadership and moving Atlanta forward together. I saw some state reps and other elected officials. Thank you all for being here and, and being very supportive and attentive to what's all happening with the Beltline in the city of Atlanta. And of course, the Anna Roach and the ARC and your leadership and everything. And then to all of you. Everybody, uh, Atlanta is a group project, so I'm glad that we're all a part of that project and serving uh, the city together to move this city forward. To call the Atlanta Beltline transformative may be an understatement to what this project really and truly means to the city of Atlanta. Um, and also to you, colleague, good to see you here, <laughs> Marta. You walked right across the street from Marta headquarters. <laughs> um, and so this bold undertaking of the Beltline connecting Atlanta's neighborhoods has captured global attention. Uh, I remember serving on the Beltline board uh, back in 2014 through 2017, and I knew it was big, but now as I travel the, the, the nation and travel the world, people know about this outstanding development of the Beltline. Uh, the Beltline's on every tourist's Atlanta to-do list. When you fly in, you have to go to the Beltline executives and business leaders are interested in that advancing equity and connecting their communities, they make their pilgrimages here uh, to Atlanta to see the Beltline, and we host them time and time again. The creation of the Beltline has made just about everyone in the city of Atlanta a stakeholder in its future and the future of this city. And while we like to talk about the art and the pop-ups, the food, uh, the music, the fun, all of the people riding on all kinds of rollerblades, bicycles, skates. I don't know what all they're going to come up with next, but everybody that's on the Beltline, when we talk about that, what the Beltline really is doing is connecting us, and in many cases, reconnecting us. It is connecting us to each other, co connecting us to nature, and hopefully will be connecting us to jobs and opportunities that may one day help reduce our city's income gap. It, it connects us to schools as kids go to school on the Beltline each and every day. The promise of more affordable housing, a more walkable city, promoting healthier living and thousands of acres of new and upgraded park spaces. This is why we continue to have such high hopes for the Atlanta Beltline. So this morning, I'm looking forward to hearing more of the Beltline story and how an Atlanta success has always been a, a reward to this entire region and how the promise of transit will serve to integrate with and not disrupt what Atlantans have already fallen in love with on the Beltline. So guys, I'm excited to share some space and time with you today and let's continue to celebrate the Beltline together. Thank you.
there. Thank you for that great, great uh, introduction. Okay, before I bring up our first speakers of the morning, I want to turn your attention to the QR code on your name tags and on the screen behind me. There you go. Uh, you can scan this to view the digital program for today's event, view our speakers, and read about all, of, uh, all about our featured speakers. So now to get started, I'd like to introduce uh, Clyde and Rob for the executive section set discussion called Celebrating Momentum and Planning for the Future. So Clyde Higgs joined the Atlanta Beltline, Inc. in 2015 as the Chief Operating Officer, and in February of 2019, he assumed the position as head of one of Atlanta's most transformative legacy projects. In his role, he leads the executive team in providing oversight of the economic development, design, construction, real estate development, housing, procurement, and human resources activities of ABI. Please welcome Clyde Higgs. Uh, also, I will mention that Clyde is part of the leadership team for the Council for Quality Growth and is slated to be the chairman of the council in 2025. Next, I'd like to introduce Rob Brauner. Rob is the executive director for the Atlanta Beltline Partnership. And for 13 years, Rob has guided the partnership's efforts to cultivate broad-based support for the Atlanta Beltline, generate private and philanthropic investment in the project, and catalyze positive health and economic outcomes for residents in Beltline neighborhoods. Please welcome Rob Barnum. And of course, somebody who's going to have their own big show this Friday, State of the Region. If you haven't signed up, she'll take your sign up right here. Uh, and to moderate this discussion is Anna Roach, Executive Director of the Atlanta Regional Commission. Since 2000, that's good. That's right. <laughs> I don't need to do anything else. Since 2022, Anna directs ARC's policy work across the board. She's the former uh, Fulton County uh, 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 Chief, Exec Chief Operating Officer and a lawyer by trade. Please welcome Anna, Clyde, and Rob. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for that energetic welcome, Mr. Mayor. It's always good to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, and Clyde, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, so, you have been in this role for five years now. It's a long time. A lot has changed since then. Uh, in fact, last year we celebrated the 10-year anniversary of the Eastside Trail uh, opening. Um, can you believe the trail used to look like the picture that they're about to share with us now? What a big difference, right? Um, we also know that you and the ABI team had some really big goals around affordable housing as well as economic development along the Beltline. Why don't you tell us how those goals are going and what you think you will get accomplished by 2030? Thank you, Anna. And before I get started, I definitely want to acknowledge uh, Anna Roach. I called her pretty late. Uh, for, for this assignment, and she stepped right up in a very Anna Roach way. And so can we just give a little bit of acknowledgement to, to Anna? Thank you, Pat. And, and I also want to obviously recognize my, my colleague, Rob Bronner, who's been with me through this, uh, this journey. I can't believe I've been CEO for, for five years. And, uh, but in particular, I want to, to stop and recognize uh, our great mayor. Uh, we are in the throes of many difficult conversations, and I could not be more proud and honored to have this mayor leading us through some of these difficult conversations. And so can we just recognize the mayor real quick? Absolutely. And, and also, you know, th this, is, this is a very reflective time for me, Anna. I, I remember uh, shucks, uh, State of the Belt line in 2019. Uh, many of you were, were there. A lot of members from City Council were at that State of the Belt line four years ago at Park Tavern. And uh, that was a great crowd. Uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of energy, but there was a lot of ambiguity as well. We did not have a clear picture of how we were going to, to fund 
uh, the Beltline Trail. Lots of ambiguity there, but lots of good energy. And so, so very reflective you know, during this, uh, this last five years. But I will tell you, looking forward, this is perhaps the, the golden years for, for the Beltline. We hosted uh, three groundbreaking to just this calendar year for, for new trail uh, segments. Uh, we're also going to do, whereas Alex, we're about to, to embark uh, on uh, a ribbon cutting for a segment of the Northeast Trail on November 1st at 10 a.m. if anyone wants to, wants to come out. But definitely we are in a good, good period, Anna. So I think last year, uh, what I shared is that within the next 24 months that we will have uh, over 80% of the Beltline completed or under construction. And now I'm happy to announce to you that within the, the next year, we'll have over 85% of the Beltline project, trail project, uh, under construction or completed by the end of next year. That is nothing less than spectacular. The mayor mentioned all the visitors that we get from around the globe, just really under, trying to understand the magic of Atlanta, the magic of the Atlanta Beltline. And it really is because of, of you all and what you've done. And, and I'm also being reflective about the time uh, in early 2021 where city council and the mayor at that time you know, had the, the foresight, uh, the gumption to pass what we describe as the SSD, the Special Service District. Ultimately, that generated $100 million for, for Beltline trail construction. And so just a lot of magnificent energy and gumption to make this project happen. And so lots of activity. We're in a really good space right now. Uh, the economic development piece of the Beltline continues to impress me. So you know we have invested roughly about $750 million into the Beltline project to date, which, which is impressive. But on top of that, and I have a lot of my real estate friends in the audience, but on top of that, we have witnessed about a $9 billion private investment along the Beltline. And we're not even halfway there yet. Uh, we're also excited that we will not only meet our affordable housing goal, Mayor, by the end of 2030, um, but there is a world where we think we'll, we'll exceed that 5,600 unit number for, for affordable housing. So yes, let's give that, give that some acknowledgement. But the times are good, um, but this is the type of energy that we need moving forward. Uh, we have, again, some really robust conversations that we need to have about the next iteration of, of Beltline. But again, with this group, I think we can get there. But good times, Anna. Fantastic. I actually, I actually remember that first meeting. I was there, and you did not shy away from the aspirations for affordability along the Beltline, and I appreciate you and the leadership of the city of Atlanta for sticking uh, with that mission all throughout the development of the Beltline. So, next question. Rob, I want to thank you for your leadership of the partnership. It's been incredibly complimentary to the work that Clyde has done uh, with the Beltline itself. Uh, but we recognize that the successes that we are all talking about of the Beltline has also brought uh, some challenges to legacy residents as well as small buildings that are traditionally located there. So, can you tell me a little bit bit about, this question's for both of you, but I'll start with you, Rob. Tell me a little bit about what your organizations are doing to support uh, these groups to ensure that everybody has uh, equal opportunity as the Beltline gets developed. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Uh, appreciate that question. And, and again, thank you to everybody for being here, Clyde, for your partnership, Mayor, for your leadership, all the elected officials, and, and of course, philanthropic supporters, uh, you know, which is where the Beltline Partnership focuses a lot of our efforts. Um, in addition to that SSD funding that, that Clyde spoke about, obviously, the you know, more than $100 million contributed uh, through the Robert W. Woodruff Foundation and the Cox Foundation to help uh, make sure we have that progress along the, the trail corridor is hugely important. But another place that the philanthropic community is really investing um, in, a, in a very meaningful way is helping to keep 
existing residents, particularly low-income homeowners in communities around the Beltline. So Anna, is, as you mentioned, um, obviously as the Beltline comes in, that is great for community. It creates a lot of vibrancy and excitement and demand, frankly, for people to live in communities around the Beltline. And with all the great progress that, that Clyde and his team have made around creating a, you know, new affordable units, uh, you may or may not know that the TAD, the, the Tax Allocation District, actually can't be used to help single-family homeowners because th that funding needs to be spent within the, um, within the boundaries of the TAD, which, which do, generally do not include single-family homeowners. So the philanthropic community, uh, led by, again, the Woodruff Foundation, Bank of America, Georgia Power, uh, a number of others, have stepped in to actually cover the increase in property taxes for low-income homeowners along the south and west side of the Beltline. And we... Yeah, we now have more than 200 people in this program. And, and one thing I'll, I'll point out on this is it's not only about keeping them in the community, that's certainly important, but what's really important is helping them hold on to that home and build wealth. We know there is a wealth gap, um, not only in Atlanta, but around the country. And you know, I would challenge many people to point out a uh, faster appreciating asset than a home along the Beltline. So to allow low-income individuals to hold on uh, to that asset and pass that wealth down to the next generation is, is hugely important. Um, we also you know, work with Atlanta Beltline Inc. supporting the Beltline Marketplace, uh, which has also been philanthropically funded. I'll let Clyde talk a little bit about, about that program and specifically how it's helping small business, but with the Candida Fund and Google and others um, has supported the launch of that. Thank you, Rob, for, for those comments. And uh, yeah, a lot of good effort on the affordable housing side. So Rob talked a little bit about the Legacy Resident Retention Fund. Uh, it's still open, so if anyone wants to write a check to the partnership, bring, bring them out. Um, but for the long-term health of our city, one of the things that, that we're doing, uh, Anna, is making sure that we are grabbing up and securing land and putting it into the public domain. So we have quadrupled our land for housing affordability along the, the Beltline in the last uh, 30 months or so. So we went from about 20. Yes, yes, yes. And so we, we roughly have about 87 acres for future development for, for housing affordability and commercial uh, affordability, because I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but obviously when you control the dirt, when you control the land, you can have deeper and longer term uh, affordability. And again, I have a lot of my uh, real estate friends here in the audience, they know that, and we're having some of those deep conversations right now. But, but a conversation that we need to talk about uh, in more detail is on the commercial affordability side. And so the, the team at ABI and, and our economic development group is really focusing on how to support small businesses along the, the Beltline. One of the things that we stood up uh, last year, a little more than a year ago, is what we call uh, the Beltline Marketplace. And for, for lack of a better description, this is our first foray into the small business incubator program. So we literally have containers uh, along the Beltline. We allow small businesses to locate there at a very reasonable rate. Uh, they pay roughly 200 to $300 a month, and they get access to the millions and millions of people that walk on the Beltline on, a, on an annual basis. And those businesses, just in a short period, uh, are approaching $200,000 of additional revenue out of that Beltline marketplace. And so I definitely want to acknowledge the economic development team for pushing that forward. Um, but we were also successful in receiving a federal grant at almost $800,000 from uh, the Department of Commerce, EDA, to support small businesses as well. And so we have launched what we describe as our acceler accelerator program, Beltline Business Ventures. We selected over 20 companies uh, to be in that program and essentially providing them wraparound services to accelerate their business along the, the Beltline. So we, we've constructed this project. We have about 11 miles of mainline trail that have been constructed to date, so we're only halfway there. But as we think about the, the legacy for, for the Beltline, we want to make sure that all of Atlanta is enjoying the largesse of, of the Atlanta Beltline. 
Wow, that's incredible. Thank you both so much for that. And I remember in my former life, Clyde, we worked together on one of those acquisitions uh, from Fulton County where you were trying to use that land to preserve affordable housing. So I can personally attest to that effort uh, going strong. Um, I do want to turn back to you, Rob. Last year, you announced that the partnership hit a major philanthropic uh, goal for building the mainline trail. Um, but the partnership is still raising uh, funding um, for the Beltline. So if companies either here or watching or listening uh, wanted to support the continued work of the Beltline, tell us, tell us how they can get involved. Great. Thank, thank you, Anna. Um, <clears throat> so as we all know, right, the, the Beltline is this big, bold vision for Atlanta, and it is powered by the people of Atlanta, right? And that includes the corporate, the philanthropic community here in the city. And really since the beginning, right, when, when Atlanta's civic community came up alongside the grassroots leaders, the nonprofit organizations, Mayor Franklin at the time, right, through the Atlanta Committee for Progress, really helped to launch this and then have continued to work uh, with leadership all the way up to, to Mayor Dickens. Um, to, to advance the project, it is very much happening, you know, in large part with and because of the, the civic leadership here with many, many other public and, 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 and private partners. So currently, as we look to kind of the next stage of the Beltline, we are raising uh, philanthropic funds for three main projects. Uh, Enota Park, which is on the west side, this is going to be the next jewel of the Beltline from a park standpoint. I have the honor of serving on the mayor's uh, Green Space Council, and, and we're obviously trying to help the city grow and improve its, its park space. Um, it's going to be eight acres of just uh, wonderful active recreation, basketball courts, multi-use fields, but also nature trails and, and all this right across from uh, Kipps Drive Elementary in the Westview neighborhood. We are also working to expand Westside Park, so hopefully many of you have had the opportunity to go enjoy uh, what will be Atlanta's largest park, uh, but it's got some beautiful forest canopy that we want, really want to open access to, uh, but also help introduce people to mountain biking, which is an important um, sport and, and one, frankly, that uh, could use some growth and diversity. So having a place where families can come and learn uh, that sport and practice um, is, is part of the master plan uh, that was developed with the community and we're looking to, to help bring that forward. And then finally, the Legacy Resident Retention Program. That program goes through 2030. Um, as Clyde said, there are still spaces available. We still need uh, philanthropic funds. We know there are more uh, low-income residents out there. So those are our three kind of major, kind of big bucket items. But whether you can write like a big check Right, I, I don't. You know, we're certainly grateful again to the Woodruff, the Coxes, the Cokes, the Rocket Community Funds, Home Depots, others, uh, Blank Foundation, who have who have made those really big projects happen. Um, but really, every company in here, right? You, well, it's not about the, all the big names and the big pocketbooks. All of you have a role that you can play in helping to advance the equity and the vision for the Beltline. And the Beltline partnership, it can be your vehicle for doing that uh, through a program we have called the Connector Circle. Right, so again, big or small, the way that uh, companies around Atlanta have really bought into and supported the Beltline, they've, uh, through our connector circle, they've learned about the Beltline. They've taken bike tours and bus tours and walking tours. Right? They've had us come out and do Beltline 101s. They volunteered their time, whether it's making the Beltline you know, more beautiful, but they've also come alongside many of those, those homeowners. One of the programs we have is our home empowerment workshops that help people lower their property taxes, um, and, and really lower their housing costs. So we've had companies who've come out and invested their time helping residents around the Beltline stay in their communities. Some have given their time to help the small businesses from a technical assistance standpoint, right? So if you have a company that does that, we can help plug you into Beltline Marketplace and other uh, programs that Atlanta Beltline Inc. has. Uh, from a health and wellness standpoint, many companies have chosen to be uh, participate in, in the health and wellness activities, which include the city of Atlanta's largest free fitness program that happens all around the Beltline, uh, includes 5K and 10K races that we do in partnership with the Atlanta Track Club. Right? And the other uh, thing that, that companies have done is they've really just helped to support the culture. Right? Art on the Beltline and other programs, right? they've come in and participated in that. So again, whether you are big or small, there is a place for you 
to help support and advance this vision for the Atlanta Beltline. Uh, certainly happy to talk to you afterwards. I think we have some materials, but that Connector Circle program is a great way for folks to do it. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. As you were talking about the Connector's Circle, I was channeling my inner Andre Dickens, which is uh, to repeat his mantra that Atlanta is a group project. And if there is a way for you to get involved to support this incredible mission, I would encourage you to, to certainly do so in support of the mayor, in support of the Beltline, in support of the partnership. Thank you for that. Yes, please. I mean, we, we hear a lot of people choose Atlanta because of the Beltline. Bam, drop the mic. Okay. <laughs> My, a, little, a little bit of a mic drop moment there. Okay. Uh, so please get involved. Shifting gears just a little bit. Going back to you, Clyde, I'd like to spend uh, just a little bit of time this morning talking about transit. We'll hear from our esteemed MARTA CEO in just a minute. Um, but wanted to talk to you as the executive of the Beltline. With all of the business opportunity that you and Rob just talked about, uh, we know that people will want access uh, to get either from their workplace or their home to the Beltline, uh, as well as to other destinations. Is transit a part of the, the answer for that from the Beltline's perspective? Absolutely, yes. Um, transit is a part of that. That is the, the DNA of the Atlanta Beltline. And so, I, I'm again, as I'm reflective, I'm reminded of uh, the vote that we had in the city of Atlanta in 2016 when you all uh, decided to advance the More MARTA uh, program at an overwhelming rate. So over 70% of the city of Atlanta voted to advance transit within the city of Atlanta, but also on, on the Beltline. But you got to think about the, the original DNA of, of our project. It was about transit. And I heard uh, the mayor say this at, at our last uh, groundbreaking. Let, let, let's be honest, uh, someone who is in Oakland City is not going to necessarily, you know, ride a bike or, or jog to, to Piedmont Park if you have some physical challenges. Are you going to do that when the weather is challenging? And so, so having transit is something that really is a necessity. It's not necessarily a nice to have. And I, I think I heard you say this before, Anna, that uh, we are going to, to add another almost two million people to the city of Atlanta and the surrounding areas uh, in the next 25, 26 years. What are we gonna do? We have to give people options to get around the city. And this is not necessarily even for me, it's not necessarily for you or for you, but it's really for, for our grandkids, our great grandkids. What are we gonna set up? Are we gonna set them up for success? If we are, we really need to start thinking about giving them options on how to get around the city. And I'll say this because I love to brag on Atlanta. Uh, I'm on various boards across the, the country and people love Atlanta. You know, Money Magazine ranked Atlanta as the number one city uh, in the country. All of this, the, the culture, our airport, uh, the city and the forest, all of those things that, that we love, but what's our Achilles tending? Our traffic, our traffic. And so, so we have to address that. And I think the Beltline is going to, to be that opportunity for us to do something really significant for our kids. We're not doing this for today, we're doing this for, for our great grandkids in the future. So you touched on this a little bit in your response. I'll um, tease, it, tease it out a little bit. You know, you're, you're right. Our draft regional forecasts indicate that by 2050, which is our uh, planning uh, phase, uh, nearly 2 million people will move uh, to Metro Atlanta, 1.8 to be exact. So how does that level and pace of growth impact uh, your decision, the Beltline's decision, about transit options on, on the Beltline. You talked about uh, planning for the future, planning for our kids, but we'll have some migration in that as well. So we got to plan for more grown-ups too. For, for sure, for sure. And, and that's one of the things that the Beltline is about. You know, it's about that densification within the city of Atlanta. 
and let's think about how people like to, to live and get around. One of the things that we are very hopeful to, to do is make sure that we give people access to, to all of the things that they care about from a quality of life perspective without having to get into a personal vehicle. And so that means being able to, to access a medical facility. That means being able to access a place of higher learning, uh, a restaurant, uh, whatever it is that really contributes to, to your life. We want to create these whole communities where you don't have to necessarily get in a personal vehicle. And as we talk about housing affordability, so Council Member Westmoreland, you know, obviously we talk a lot about uh, the land acquisition strategy. Uh, Mayor, we talk about the production of new units, the preservation of new units, but we also have to talk about the other side of the math equation. How do you take expenses out of people's households, whether it be energy or a personal vehicle expense that's subtracted out of someone's household? And that's what transit is going to do for us, is give people options where you don't have to necessarily have a $700 car note plus insurance plus maintenance, but you can really, you know, buy a pass from, from MARTA and, and for $30 a month and get around the city to the things that you care about. Understood. Um, digging a little bit deeper, last transit question, I promise, maybe. Um, some people in the community are also asking, why start on the east side trail with transit, if that's in your plans? Why, why the east side trail? Yeah, I mean, it comes down to the high level answer is it comes down to, to what's ready today. And so if you think about from a shovel ready perspective, uh, the east side of the Beltline is, is ready to go with regards to, to the technical assessment of a future transit. But you gotta think about this holistically. We're actually in the throes of the Beltline transit study uh, that will talk about many connections of transit that will ultimately go west uh, as well. So you gotta think about the, how we constructed the Beltline. We did not do this in a clock-wide you know, perspective. And so you gotta do segments that are ready. You gotta do segments that are not quite ready, but you get them ready. So we will not be in this pretty one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock uh, perspective. And so, so that's why we're starting on the East Side Trail because it is the one that is, is ready right now. Okay, I'm sure the audience appreciates that explanation. Thank you. One more tough que question on transit. Sure. Just wanted to warm you up for this one. So we hear uh, concerns, you've heard them, we've read them, we've all heard them. Uh, concerns from our partners, as well as some people in this room may have these concerns uh, about um, transit coming to the Beltline. Is it safe? Is it going to negatively experience, uh, impact the experience we currently have? Are we going to lose our canopy that you talked about before? You know, are we considering the best technology that's available for the Beltline, when you hear people raise those concerns, either in the community or the media or, or, or otherwise, how, how do you respond to those concerns? Yeah, I mean, I, I hear it. And I hear this from, from my friends, uh, people who I respect. Uh, there are two sides, perhaps three sides to, to this argument. As a matter of fact, uh, later on, I want you all to get ready to take out your phones and go to slido.com. We're actually going to do a poll to really get your thoughts about future Beltline Transit. Uh, we are not gonna be uh, tone deaf uh, with regards to the com this conversation, but I will tell you that the bulk of the challenges that we're having or the debate that we're having comes down to, to aesthetics. And I hear it from, again, from my friends. They'll say, Clyde, you know, I, I don't know that we need this overhead cantonary system. You know, that, that's not very attractive and it won't feel good in the Beltline corridor. That, that is a design and technology discussion. Or, or Clyde, you know, we don't need, you know, more concrete uh, in the Beltline corridor. That's also a design discussion. You literally can have grass tracks underneath a uh, streetcar. And so there are a number of ways to, to really soften this because what we mean by, by Beltline Transit is something very verdant, 
something very green, something that's very approachable. We're not talking about a 50 mile an hour vehicle, and Kali will attest to this, that will be barreling down, down the belt line. And so, so a lot of the discussion, the debate, is really one that is about aesthetics. And so I think we need to do, and that's what our hope is today, is to be a convener to have people that care, people that are of goodwill and are reasonable about our city to come together underneath this tent and let's have these conversations. Let's talk about what Beltline Transit means. And I guarantee you, we are all agreeing on about 75% of the issues. And so subsequent to this meeting, Anna, you will again see us rolling out more community engagement, more conversations so that we can bring people again underneath the, t underneath the tent in this very Atlanta way and have some of these real discussions. But I want people to really have a baseline understanding about what we mean by, by transit. Because I, I want personally something that's very verdant and green. We don't need a concrete monstrosity that is in the middle of the belt line. We can use bushes, trees as a way to create barriers between trail and transit. So again, those are design items that we can work around. And so those are some of the conversations that we need to have, Anna. Okay, good. There's nothing wrong with uh, having conversation. I think, you know, uh, Metro Atlanta is the place if something uh, transformational was going to happen, it could happen here. Uh, but the difference between what we have in our minds and what's realistic and affordable is something else that we got to think about. So I think you're doing the absolute right thing, pulling all the stakeholders together to have the conversation and listening to the public and seeing what they want. So I appreciate your leadership on that conversation. Thank you so much. I do want to thank both Rob and Clyde for such an incredible discussion. And I appreciate y'all listening. Go ahead and get my mic here. So we're going to transition to to the next section of the program, and so I want to invite uh, my friends and my colleagues uh, up to the stage. And so I'm going to call them by by name. Uh, first, I want to to introduce uh, the CEO for for Portman Holdings, uh, Ambrish Batswala, to come up to to the to the stage. All right. Yep. All right. And then next, I want to invite Jim Irwin, who heads up New City uh, here in Atlanta, up to the stage. And I also want to invite Lisa Benjamin, who is our fearless COO of the city of Atlanta, uh, up to, to the stage. And also the GM and the CEO for, for MARTA, uh, Kali Greenwood, up to the stage. Appreciate it, appreciate it. All right, so we're going to have another just conversation with, uh, with family. And, uh, and you will hear some different opinions. Uh, on this uh, this panel, and that's what we want. We want to to have a robust conversation. And again, later on, I want you to again get your phones out and go to slido.com uh, because we're going to have an opportunity to to take a poll here. Um, but just, this is just kind of a, a warm up question for for you all. Uh, I know that you all are very well traveled, uh, been around the country, been around the the globe. Uh, are there any transit systems that, uh, that you really love uh, across the city, or, or rather across the, the state, across the, the country, across the, the globe? 
uh, what is impressive to you out there? Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Beltline is one of my favorite projects. Most of you know I was there for almost six years yes. um, as COO yes. uh, before Clyde uh, joined the team. And um, so excited also for our city that we love. And I think um, some of the most impressive systems that I've been to are the systems that are easy to use. So I would say when I went to uh, Portland and Seattle uh, for for some conferences. Um, at that time, I was just new to the Beltline and I hadn't experienced transit. We're talking about 2016, um, 2015, actually even before that, 2012. And um, going to those cities, I was able to easily, with no one telling me how to get around, get on um, transit from the airport and went straight to da into downtown to get to my hotel. And then I took a, a streetcar down the street to the hotel, and then while I was there, I was able to pick up a bike on the street and bike to the receptions and the different events. And I would say um, that was when we went from Portland uh, to Seattle, and there was a whole, you know, we were there for four to five days, and I didn't have to get in a car or take a taxi. And that was back, I would say, um, almost 10 years ago, 2012, 2013. And I thought about what a difference that would make for Atlanta if we had that ease of use. And so even when I've tried to use transit in Atlanta um, for periods of time, I can get to certain places, but that last mile connection of all my meetings today, I could have gotten to Lindbergh by transit today, but then my next two meetings, could I easily get to them? And without calling Kali and saying, hey, how do I get here? What buses do I take? And I think that investment in our infrastructure is what we need for options, access, and opportunity. And that's what I liked about those systems. The other thing, the other system I'll mention was in DC. So I went to school in DC, and when I went to school in DC, um, I went to Georgetown University, and Georgetown had refused to get a transit stop on the metro when they first were building it. They didn't have to pay anything. And I was at Georgetown uh, a year or two ago, and people said, we're getting a metro stop at Georgetown, and Georgetown is paying for it. It's upwards of $500 million. And it was you know, 20, 30 years later, but even as a student, I was able to get on the bus and go all around the city and walk, and that was before what they have today. So today they have streetcar, light rail, the metro system, bikes, and so when I go to DC now for conferences, I literally have biked to certain places and I have gone um, on the Metro and I have gotten on the light rail on um, different corridors where they've added that. So in a 30 year period, I have seen that city transform itself. And that city is very similar to Atlanta in having an urban core and su suburbs around it and a lot of interaction on a day to day. And so I would say that's ease, but I also see the vision of the parts of DC that embraced the Metro and embraced transit and access and options early on, and then I see my own university, they still don't have a stop, they're promised to stop, and now they're paying for it themselves, but all the students and all the commerce and economic development that was cut off um, from the school, I, that's what I think of, and I think as we look at transit and transit solutions, it's really about access, it's really about opportunities, it's really about ease of getting around, and it's really about um, inclusivity of our community. And if you go to DC, very inclusive community in terms of um, people. And I think there's some stigmas around transit and transportation. And I think that's one of the issues we have to address as we have a real conversation about the future of our city. So I just gave you a 30 year history, but what's 30 years look like for us when we get to 2030? And what decisions do we make today that really make our city a world-class city. Said, well said, Lisa. We appreciate that. And uh, and, and Kali, I want to go over to to you. So, I think uh, there's a stat out there that uh, over eight percent of the U.S. population uh, doesn't own a car. Uh, but I think in Metro Atlanta, it's double that. I think it's closer to to 16 percent. Uh, how do you see MARTA's role in advancing future transit 
uh, within the, the city in Atlanta and beyond. And also, if there are any systems out there that you really respect, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. And thanks uh, for those fantastic comments. Lisa, I think I would love to get a soundtrack of some of the things that have been said this morning about transit because it's the kind of stuff I've been saying for, uh, for my entire career. So thanks, everyone, for being here, for being in, engaged in this conversation. Um, when transit is at the center of the, of the conversation, it's something that's good for all of us. I think, Clyde, when I think about systems that have always impressed me, I mean, you, you, the elephant in the room is MTA in New York. I, I just love going there. I think I feel like New York City is one big transit-oriented development. I think uh, the fact that there are just so many people that are dependent on transit, the, the amount of redundancy in the transit system, if it's not working on 52nd, go over to 54th, you'll still get where you're going. Um, the infrastructure doesn't really support everyone operating a POV, and some of there's a sense of necessity in, uh, in building that kind of density on the system. So when we talk about density and people coming to Atlanta, that's a transit operator's dream because that's what we're built for. I mean, the, the, the Taylor Swift concert, the Janet Jackson concert, the Super Bowls, those are just glimpses of what transit can be to this, to this city. And so we really welcome the opportunity, bring them, because transit will indeed be ready for them. Um, Toronto's another system that I, I happen to enjoy. Um, I've seen, in, in particular streetcars, I've seen that system work really, really well. I was responsible for it, so it better have worked well, but it's, um, it's a, uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a hundred million riders a year on the streetcar system in Toronto. It's got 11 routes, 50 miles, times two because you get you know a transportation or a rider sees 50 miles of travel. A maintenance person sees 100 miles of track to maintain. But uh, there's so so again there's there's a huge modal or 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 city demand for the mode, right? So there's a a modal adoption in Toronto and in New York. Um, that exceeds 35 and even 50% in some cases. And so that's something that we have to work on locally, is just to make sure that modal share for transit increases from the 7% that we're facing now to something more in the neighborhood of you know, 30, 35%. That's when we can start to really encourage people to, um, to talk about it, to spread the word. The other thing I like about uh, transit is, I, I think Lisa mentioned some, some, or somebody mentioned some, some European cities earlier. And we've been there, Clyde, you were talking about it and showing the slides. Um, Paris, um, um, some of our, our spots in, um, in well, par Paris in particular, but also I liked, uh, there's, there's a, a sp I think it was Barcelona, um, some fantastic uh, streetcar networks there. And what I like there is just this, it's kind of like an organic, innate, coexistence of pedestrians and mass transit. So you'll see the crowds dissipate, the streetcar come through, and then like water, the crowds come back over that embedded track that's, you know, the, the wonderful photos of the, the tracks in the grass. And so you just see that magnificent coexistence. Ideally, that's the kind of thing that we could, that we could bring here to Atlanta. I, I, pragmatically, I do have to caution everyone that safety is, is not, um, negotiable, uh, and so if, if a fence has to be there, if a hardscape barricade has to be there, it simply has to be there, and we, we just couldn't go forward building something without it if we decide in the design that it has to be there. So we'd have to keep that in, in mind. Uh, we have to make sure that, you know, when I was over in Bilbao at one point in Spain and I asked them about injuries and, and you know, litigation, because you're actually right in, concept, in contact with the, with the streetcar network. And they just kind of looked at me like, litigation? <laughs> but you know, I'm trying to apply all of these things to the Atlanta environment. So we, of course, there are so many things that we have to continue this conversation on. We have to make it work. I want it to look good, but I want it to be safe. And so, um, so you know, that's my experience with, with transit systems um, you know, around the world that, that kind of impressed me. I think our role, quite frankly, at MARTA is, is to make sure that we deliver the best of what the process yields, right? So there's no doubt, and you said it earlier, that, that transit has been a part of the Beltline design since its inception. You talked about, uh, you know, 2014 opening the, the Atlanta streetcar, 2015, City of Atlanta adopts the streetcar transit plan, 2016, the voters speak. 
Um, and so it, it's never been a question of whether or not there would be transit on the Beltline. The question has always been what, how, and where. And, um, and so these are the conversations that we, have to, that we have to continue to have. Indeed, indeed. All right, uh, Ambrish, you were well-traveled. Uh, you've been CEO for, for Portman for some time, but I know you've been in Australia, uh, Dubai, Europe. Uh, anything that, that is amazing to you from a transit perspective, and would also love to hear about the developments that Portman also has in the city of Atlanta that are close to, uh, to MARTA stops and also close to, to Beltline. So, so talk to us a little bit uh, about those two things. Yeah, so, so Clyde, first of all, I have to tell you all that I really appreciate our MARTA. And uh, I actually got something for Kali, so I got to pull this up, so give me a minute. So this is a poster from 1982 with John Portman when the Peachtree Center station was opened, uh, just encouraging people to ride Mata. And, uh, we had this in the archives, I had to pull this out. Uh, you know, Portman's done 23 buildings that are either incorporated transit or was within 0.2 miles of a MARTA station, about 25 million square feet uh, over the last sort of uh, 60 years. And uh, beyond, uh, going beyond Atlanta, yeah, we'll put it aside. Going beyond Atlanta, we've done about 16 buildings, about 8 million square feet uh, that either incorporated transit um, or, or it was within point one mile of a transit station. So transit is very important to us. Um, you know, looking, looking around the world, I mean, there are many systems that are very good. Uh, ultimately, a good transit system, I mean, we need transit, right? And a good transit system, to me, is about extensive coverage, about frequency, and about multiple modes of transport. Um, and it has to kind of link up to urban growth and kind of where people are living. You know, the notion of where we live and where we work um, and education and then where we play basically is what drives mobility. Um, how we work is changing. If you look at Atlanta, you know, we've got five distinct office cores, of course, hundreds of neighborhoods. Um, we, we need a transit system that's available, that we can actually implement. It doesn't take billions of dollars and decades to deliver. You know, it needs to be delivered fast. So to me, the best transit system is the one that's, that you can implement and it's extensive, and it's got multiple modes of transit. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim is also uh, a friend, Jim Irwin, who heads up New City. Uh, you may remember Jim from his days at Jamestown, where he was leading the development for, for Pont City Market, and, uh, and has been just one of our, our friends of, of Beltline that we can always have uh, some of these tough conversations with. And so, so, Jim, talk to us a little bit about some of your new developments along the, the Beltline, and specifically your, your tenants. And uh, how many of the tenants actually use the Beltline to get back and forth to, to work and wherever they live uh, on, a, on a regular basis? Thank you, Clyde. I, I appreciate the question and, and the invitation. It's, it, it is such an honor to, to be having this conversation as a, as a native Atlantan. And I, I think we should stop and, and talk about what a privilege it is for us to be having these debates about, about these sort of future thinking things. You know, our city is growing up so quickly. It, the economic engine that we have is so outstanding that, that we are really having these debates about, you know, infrastructure and, and the future of our city. And I really think that you know, when we're talking about making an, an investment like this, I think we need to take a minute to really think about the fact that this is really a reflection of the ambition of our citizenry. This is, the, you know, the, the quality and, the, and the, the connectivity that we're, that we're able to discuss and provide is really going to be a reflection of, of the nature of what we aspire to be as a city and, and as, a, as a community. Um, and so for that reason, I think what we really need to be is pro-excellence. That, that, I think, is sort, sort of what should govern everything that we do. We need to be about quality. 
I think the not so secret secret about what the Beltline has done is it has brought together not just all of the, you know, it's, it's connected so many neighborhoods, but also just literally the materials, the, the, the standards that ABI holds, you know, they're, they're really using materials, the granite, the steel, the, the concrete, everything they're doing is a hundred year project. It's something that needs to look good for a hundred years. And I think what we've seen is this like catalytic embrace of, of, of this quality. You know, we're, we're great as a city at doing things quickly and for so long, we really need to be about doing things well. And, and I think that's why everyone has loved the Beltline. It's not necessarily something that if you're not an architect or a landscape engineer, you can't like name it, but you can feel it. And I think, I think as we talk about introducing transit to the Beltline, we need to keep that in mind, really. We need to be pro-excellence. And, um, and I think, too, with, as, we, as we talk about building commercial spaces, places for people to live, work, eat, uh, on the Beltline, uh, one, one tenant comes to mind uh, that will actually be moving into our project on the East Side Trail, MailChimp, uh, many of you know, uh, has leased over 300,000 square feet in one of our projects on the East Side. And, and the reason that they chose the East Side Trail is because one third of their employees use the Beltline every day to get to work. And, and so we are, they're actually moving in, we're, get, we're getting ready for the, the tsunami that's coming of, of uh, MailChimp employees in, in January. We're getting excited about that. Uh, we actually literally, no joke, have three more, more you know, bike racks on order to, to get ready for everybody that's coming. Uh, our parking operator actually is gonna be setting up bike valet uh, to, to receive all those, all those bikes as they come. So, it's a, it's a phenomenal thing that this is not just fun. It's not just a weekend activity. It's not just something that is kind of, you know, a trivial, you know, literal walk through the park. This is actually like we are at a point in our city where people are actually using this five, six, seven days a week, not just to walk around and go to a great restaurant, but to, to actually get to and from work. And what are they saying, Jim, about future transit? Is there excitement about it? So, so yes, we love that the MailChimp employees, a third of them are using uh, the Beltline to, to walk or, or bike back and forth to work and home. But what are you hearing about future Beltline transit expansion? Are you hearing anything positive, negative? And, and this is the time for us to have some, some real conversations here. But I'd love a glimpse into to what you're hearing from potential tenants. Absolutely. So, so starting at Pont City Market and then at 725 Ponts and now at our, at our current fourth ward project, it has been essential, it has been a non-negotiable that we provide shuttles to and from the North Avenue MARTA station. And so if you see a bus, you know, these sort of short buses wrapped with Ponts logos or 725 or now the, the new one we just introduced a few weeks ago for our initial tenants. And every single project that I've done we've always had to add more buses. And, and it, because of the demand for people using MARTA to get to the North Avenue station. So, I mean, they are literally overrun with demand. We track usage and, and every 15 minutes those buses come. We've had to develop an app that people can use to, to know when to walk down to catch the bus. And, and so, and literally in our leases with our tenants, we're writing in, you know, we are able to adjust the bus schedule once transit comes. And, and so as I'm walking through the lobbies, hanging out with, with you know, folks working in the buildings, it is literally every week that I get a question like, when's, when's transit? What do you know about transit? How's it coming? What do you hear? So all right. All right. I mean, the excitement and the energy around it is, is outstanding. That's great. Kali, please. Can you all hear me? There we yeah. go. Um, just to follow up on that theme, Clyde, you mentioned it earlier that a lot of the concerns about transit on the Beltline are aesthetic. And so, you know, we, we hear them too. We hear about the tree canopy. Um, we also hear about the, um, th the whole idea of the pedestrian and cyclist experience of the current Beltline and making sure that we don't sort of lose that in, mm -hmm. our, in, our, in our wake. And, and a word about technology, we, you know, we, Marta's very interested in making sure that we 
apply the latest and the greatest in terms of modal uh, availability. Mm -hmm. We think about um, even the, the concept of off-wire battery electric vehicles so that the whole catenary overhead wire system, the aesthetics of that is no right. longer a, a concern. These are all things that we're looking at and, and addressing. So, you know, bearing in mind that the concept was developed before the iPhone was invented, um, we're, we're keeping our options open in terms of what's available as we move towards the finish line. And I just think that's very important to, uh, to bear in mind. Uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's a key point. And I'll go back to COO uh, Benjamin about, uh, so many of you know, we, we know Lisa also as the, the former CEO for, for Habitat. And so, so this conversation about equity and transit, how do you get people from where they live currently to, to job centers? And again, as we talk about equity and the whole affordability conversation, we got to think about it in that vein. And so, so Lisa, I'll ask you to put your former ho housing hat back on. How do you look at transit from, from an equity perspective for, for the residents in the city of Atlanta? Thank you, Clyde. I think um, the mayor has four pillars uh, for our administration, and one of, that, one of them is a city with opportunity for all. And we also have an initiative this year, most of you know the Year of the Youth, and I think about our youth, what are the options for our youth to get around? And as you said, many youth are not car, uh, car dependent or their parents um, may not be able to take them or not take them places, but housing is a major issue for us. And as you have shown, the 5,600 units on the Beltline is just the beginning of adding housing equity, but housing and transportation represents more than one paycheck for most households. And as we have all of the businesses and economic development that's coming to our city, there's a lot of different workers that all companies need that make below $75,000 a year. So if they're making $75,000 a year and 50% of that is going to housing and transportation, that leaves a small amount for them to live on. So I think the housing options and affordability, it's not just that group, it goes beyond that group, but that's kind of the first group that is needed. And when we had the pandemic, that was the group that we relied on to come into work. And so I think as we have our goal of increasing housing for 20,000 units of affordability, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We need more options across all the economics for housing, but we also need more options for um, transportation that connects those people to job centers and connects them to amenities and connects them to our great community. So if we wanna continue to have the economic development that we have where companies are choosing Atlanta at a record rate, rate we have to have options for all of the people that work in those, in those businesses. Otherwise, they won't be viable in our community. Well said, well said. And, and so, Jim, uh, Kali, you touched on something about aesthetics. Jim, I think your word was, was excellence. Uh, Kali, you used the word aesthetics. So, so talk to us a little bit more about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on, on Ambrish here, but Ambrish, what, what are you hearing about just some of the, the heartburn for future transit? Uh, does it feel like an aesthetics and an advancement conversation to you? Is it about the trees? Is it about the overhead wire system? Is that the bulk of what you're hearing uh, out there is, is aesthetics versus we don't want transit? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, Clyde, it is about all of that, but let's kind of step back from this for a moment. So let's look at the big picture. And, uh, you know, to the comment that Atlanta is a group project, right? So if Atlanta does well, all of us do well. We all benefit from that, right? So the, when we talk about the notion of transit, uh, ultimately it's to lean into the overall solution of a better quality of life and access and transit and less congestion and all of those things. And, and if you look at what the Atlanta market is, you know, so just for example, so the total office supply in the broader Atlanta MSA is probably, and Chris can correct me on this, probably somewhere around 230, 250 million square feet. Um, about two million is around the Beltline, right? So less than 1%. So if you look at the housing supply, it's probably a similar percentage, right? 
So really people are going to the Beltline. It's not a generator of, it's employment in the retail and entertainment and people are really going there to enjoy the Beltline, right? And so I, I think the concerns that we are hearing and certainly the concerns that we have is we have great need, we have limited resources, right? Where is that money best spent? And, and are we creating a system, and, and you know, yes, there are concerns around aesthetics and free canopies and all of that, but are we basically creating a system that's going to cost a lot and it's going to basically cater just to a very small portion of the demand? So, you know, we all, by the way, and we kind of championed this at that time, the MoMATA vote, we kind of went out there and asked people to vote for it. It had a list of 74 projects. The Beltline was one piece of it. I think that 74 list has been whittled down to, and Kali, I don't want to, to a very small number now, right? And Marta's in a tough place, you know, whatever they do, they kind of get hit over the head for it. So I have a lot of sympathy for that. But, but the reason, so, so there's such great need, but because there is this pressure around creating an extension to the streetcar on the belt line that's taking resources away from other projects that can be implemented much faster, provide much greater solution, and lean into the city in a much better way. So I think this is the debate for us to be having. You know, if we are providing this funding for transit, where is that bigger solution from? And, and of course, then a subset of that debate is, you know, if whatever transit we do on the Beltline, what does it look like and what does it do? And there's been so, so much commentary around how the Beltline is an attractor for investment capital and residents moving to Atlanta, right? We want to be very careful and protective about that experience, you know, and, and I know that everybody has aligned about that. So to me, that's really a secondary issue. The bigger issue is we have great transit needs, we have limited dollars, and we need this transit now. And so to me, a more effective solution is, you know, let's take the existing MATA network and, you know, ridership, and this is not just MATA, this is across the whole country, transit ridership has been flat over the last 20 years, over the last 10 years of falling. Um, it's, it's fallen off a cliff post-COVID. Ride sharing has been the biggest factor and the biggest driver of that, but micromobility has been a big contributor. You know, the, the, notion, the notion of rail on the Beltline was conceived in 1999. J just to put this in context, that was eight years before the iPhone was invented. You know, it's technologies move and needs move. We, we need something that's effective and extensive now and not over time. So that's my bigger concern, basically. That's fair. And, and Jim, you know, from, from your real estate perspective, I'd love, is, is that what you are hearing? Is it is an aesthetics debate more than, than transit or no transit? I, I, I don't hear that. I hear about how it's going to feel in the corridor. Is that your experience? It is. I think, I think the, really the, the, the vast majority of the debate that I hear is, is really we have this unbelievable city-changing amenity with the Beltline, and how do we not detract from the quality that people feel? That's really the, the crux of the, of the discussion. Right. And, and I think that as, as our city grows, obviously because the Beltline is such a catalyst for growth, I, I think something, to reiterate something that you said a few minutes ago about the, the nature of the growth of our city and what's coming, really what we're, what we're preparing for, again, is, is let's, let's continue to keep this a 100-year asset and really make sure that it's not something that kind of provides, you know, fortresses and barriers, but really integrates seamlessly into what's already an amazing place. That's great. Well, we are about to wrap up, but I want to, to go down the, uh, the line. I uh, see City Council President Doug Shipman out here, but I'm, I'm gonna go through this, uh, this Doug, so you'll get a little feel from, from this panel. So, Jim. Are you bullish? Can we make this happen? Yes or no? Well, yeah, we're Atlanta. All right, all right, all right, all right. I I'm Breesh. Yes, yes, give that, give that. I'm we're going to do it. All right, all right. Kali, bullish or, or not? Can we make this happen? We can make anything happen. We have to decide what this is. All right, all right. COO Benjamin. 
I say yes, and I, I say we're a city built for the future. So 100 years from now, what is the legacy we're leaving to our generation? Like you said, our, our kids, our great grandkids, what are we leaving them and what does that look like? But I do think to Ambrish, um, comment about technology, let's look for some of the future technology mm -hmm. of what will drive this project. So we're looking at today and we're making decisions based on today, but we have to be forward looking to be a city that continues to be world class today and in the future. Great. Fantastic comments. Let's give the, the panelists a round of, of applause here. Thanks. All right, I will uh, ask you all to, to exit the stage, but let's make sure we get a picture. Uh, we have one more assignment before everyone leaves, and that is on the survey. So why don't you pull out your phones and either go to slido.com or use this, uh, this code, and we're going to ask you a couple of questions here just to get a little bit of feedback. Why do you use the Beltline? Select all that apply, and we'll get some re real-time feedback from your participation. All right, we have a lot of participation here with roughly 100 people participating. It looks like recreation, exercise, retail shopping are kind of the, the leading areas with regards to the respondents. And, uh, and then what part of the Beltline do you use most often? All right, that is predictable. How often do you ride public transit? All right, that is also a telling slide. Did you learn something new about the Beltline Transit from this discussion, or not? All right, just to round this up, so we learned a lot about the Beltline. If you could change something about the current streetcar, what would it be? That is good information. All right, very good. Well, thank you all for, for taking that survey. I'm going to hand this back over to Michael Paris to close this out. But thank you all very much for, for your attendance. Great job. Great job. Thank you, Clyde. Thank you all for being here. This has been a great morning, a great amount of information. So 11 Alive says, Every day the next week is 11, so get out on the Beltline. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our participants, our panelists. Thank you all. Have a great day.